I'm here with Scott Murray, who is a code artist who writes software for creating data visualizations. He's also an assistant professor at the University of San Francisco and wrote interactive data visualizations for the web. Hi, Scott. Hi. So uh, let's start out talking about how you obtain data or where you get data. So you want to come up with a good, clean data set. Are there any things you need to know about that or any advice you can give us about how you would obtain that data set? I mean, I know there are a lot of sources of free data or you might have data that's mm -hmm. associated with your company. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, that's, um, for, it's funny because uh, for people interested in visualization, uh, we often complain that actually getting the data is like 90% of the work <laughs> and the visualization part is just the last little 10%, but everyone wants to spend all their time just doing the fun visualization right, part. Right, right. So um, it, there are yeah, a lot of considerations. Obviously you want to make sure you're, you know, whatever the source is, is, is valid and hopefully wherever that data is collected from, it's coming from a trustworthy source. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably you want to tell a story that's an accurate, truthful story. Um, and there are a number of, you know, free kind of government and other like publicly ac accessible data sets. If you're getting something internally, like from your company, then mm -hmm. there's probably a whole uh, negotiation process you right. need to go through to get it in the right format mm -hmm. from the right people and to make sure you have the permission to use it and all that sort of right. thing. Right, because I can imagine there are all sorts of pitfalls, like uh, as simple as, hey, maybe a middle initial has a period and maybe it doesn't, right? And so, yeah. you know, are you dealing with inconsistencies before you head into sort of the process of data visualization and yeah. you know, creating those? Absolutely, pieces? yeah. So there's there's sort of um, getting the, the raw data to work with, and then there's kind of cleaning it up and mm -hmm. getting it ready to work with as sort of a material mm -hmm. for your project. And uh, that part can be really painless if you're lucky and r super tedious if you're not. Right. Uh, so it could be that maybe the, the tools you're planning on using for the visualization require the data to be in a certain format, like maybe um, dates and times, for example. There are a bunch of different sort of standard ways to represent dates and times, but maybe you have been given a spreadsheet that says January 1, comma, right. 2013, mm -hmm. uh, but you need it to be in like a more standard, you need it to be in 1 slash 1 slash right, 13 right, right. or something like that. So. There are all kinds of uh, different tools you might use to clean mm -hmm. that up, depending on what you're trying to do. Right. Is and one of those tools Excel, or are there more programmatic ways to go about it? Yeah, absolutely. So in that case, you might probably the simplest thing would be to use something like Excel, open it in an Excel spreadsheet, and um, just use that to change the number of formats, mm -hmm. or you know, to add more decimal places, or remove some decimal places, or those little adjustments right, you can do that right. way. Other ways you might get into writing a custom script. Um, so if you've been provided data in some kind of really strange format, mm -hmm. you could pull that data in. And if you know that uh, all of the first letters in this field right. need to be capitalized or lowercase, then you can make that transformation in your script. So that's right. a bit so of more of a custom Perl, process. So you could use Perl, which is really good at, at, at text manipulation you or could use various Perl, regular expressions. Python, right? Python, a lot of people use. Um, I. I have a lot of background in processing, and process the oh, new right. version of processing mm -hmm. has a bunch of new, uh, actually like data transformation features. Great, and it makes it really nice to like load in information, tweak it, and then spit it out as JSON or CSV or whatever. Okay, so great. It's really helpful. So, once you have your data set, what's next? How do you know which visualization to choose? Is it a series of experiments to figure out how to you know show the data in the best way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, it, it totally depends on sort of the, the client or the, the context in which you're working. But typically, you would have sort of two phases. Uh, you'd have an exploratory phase and an explanatory phase. Uh, in the exploratory phase, that's typically when you would get the data in for the first time. No one's even seen it before. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just trying to generate lots and lots of different representations to figure out what's interesting about it. Um, are, are trends going up? Are trends going down? Are things getting better? Are they scattered? Are they inconclusive? Uh, and obviously some of this sort of identifying what the story is, that could be done uh, using statistics or sort of other uh, analysis tools that aren't visual. Mm -hmm. right? So depending on you know, who's on your team and who you're working with, they might do that. But from a purely kind of visualization approach, 
uh, often what you would want to do is use use tools uh, on the on the simpler end like Excel. Uh, might use something like Tableau. I think there are several new sort of online mm -hmm. web-based tools right. that are coming out that let you kind of just dump a relatively raw data set in and generate several different kinds of charts. Um, or a lot of uh, the st statistics community uh, is very fond of using R. R is a programming language that's right. sort of designed for this. So you just load in a ton of data and generate, you know, you can generate like hundreds of different plots of the same mm -hmm. data. And some of those will jump out to your human eyes as being valuable and interesting okay. and telling a story and some of them won't. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be beautiful, but they're going to just give you an idea of what's going on, give you a feel for all that information. Okay, great. So do you have to be careful to make sure that you're not misrepresenting what the data appears to be showing you? I mean, I think there are some good examples sort of in political ads or um, political um, sort of propaganda that's come out where you can, mm -hmm. it, it's it's a visualization, but it might be not quite telling mm -hmm. the story. Right, yeah, like one man's truth is another man's propaganda. Right, or, yeah. right. <laughs> so and so how do, you, how, yeah. do you, how do you make sure that you're telling the right story, that you're using maybe the right um, size of elements or, you know, the right scale, mm -hmm. and because I think scale can mess things up a lot, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, a number of people have studied this a lot and written very eloquently about it. Uh, Stephen Few and Edward Tufte uh, in particular. People who are, have spent a lot of time thinking about this question of honesty, sort mm -hmm. of, um, not just honesty in terms of the data, but like visual honesty, right, honesty right. in the rep in the sorry in the representation, mm -hmm. and there's kind of no easy answer to that question. Right, because and sometimes it, you want to be dishonest, maybe if you're you sure, know, trying yeah. to prove a point. And sometimes it's you very just, easy to be dishonest. And sometimes it just may happen accidentally, and and you're coming up with the wrong answer. So how do people avoid that? The the latter. Right, so there's the difference between being deliberately misleading mm -hmm. and being accidentally dishonest. Right, right? okay, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a great way to put it. And I suppose, I mean, it's uh, a lot of it is understanding what's going on in the data first, which hopefully you've done sort of during your exploratory phase. Mm -hmm. And then as you're entering the explanatory phase and you're figuring out how can I, how can I communicate this story honestly to other people who aren't familiar with the data like I am because mm -hmm. I've already spent all this time studying. It. Right. And and the, there's a, again no super easy answer, but um, I think it's it's definitely being honest about scale, being honest about the relationships between elements. So if if something over here is uh, twice as significant as something over here, it should only be twice as big or twice as dark or twice as you know whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be. Ten times bigger. Right. Than if there's only if the difference is only twice twice mm -hmm. as much, for example. So, um, but it is it's a very fuzzy area because all of these kind of understanding how these visual attributes are interpreted requires sort of some understanding of human perception and the way our eyes work and the way mm -hmm. our brains work because it's it's not necessarily about the actual marks on the page. It's about if other people are going to interpret this graphic as being honest or not. Um, so if somebody calls you on it and says, oh, is it really the case that this thing went up 20 times? You said, oh, no, it only went up two times. Mm -hmm. Then you know you've done something wrong. Okay. Yeah. All right. Some, some good advice. So there's a lot of tools out there, and we've mentioned certain things. And like R, we know, is really popular. Um, uh, you recommend D3, I believe, in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. So what's, what's a tool set when someone's starting to get started? What, what should they, where should they go? What should they start with um, once you have... You're ready to go. Yeah. Uh, well, I always recommend. I guess I, you know, I always recommend starting simple and starting with kind of whatever you're already familiar with. At this point, there are so many tools. It seems like every week somebody announces a new library or a new website or something that mm -hmm. helps you with this, and it can be super overwhelming to keep track of all mm -hmm. of that. Right. So, I would first start with whatever mm -hmm. whatever is familiar to you. Um, I like to use processing a lot, um, especially for work that's going to end up in print form or just sort of when you're in that 
um, you're exploring different representations because mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, very flexible. If you want to put the piece on the web, obviously I recommend D3 because it's kind of the most powerful library right now for custom data visualization. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a bar chart, it's probably a little bit overkill. Okay. Um, there are other tools that will help you make a bar chart mm -hmm. more quickly and easily. Um, but if you're doing a bar chart that has a lot of custom interaction to it or like you need really nice transitions between different views of that data, then D3 is probably a good choice. Right, so those enhancements and the design features you, you want to make your visualization have an impact are really going to come from D3. Yeah, absolutely, and then that raises a good point, which is that your choice of a tool will be affected by the final uh, medium that you want to reach, whether that's going on the web or to print um, or something else. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be informed by kind of your your personal skill set or what skills you have on mm -hmm. your team. Because um, oftentimes it's, it's best to maybe choose a less than perfect tool just because it's familiar and you'll be able to get the job done right, right then and there. Right, and, and so a lot of what everyone's doing today is of course on the web, every business needs a presence mm -hmm. on the web. Um, and so you focus on interactivity within visualizations. So w what, what sort of things can people add, um, what sort of advice can you give for people to, to add that interactivity to make a more rich experience? Yeah, well interactivity is uh, quite powerful, especially for somebody who's used to working in a print, like kind of static mm -hmm. context. Uh, and they each have their, their strengths and weaknesses. Right, right. But certainly, you know, a, a couple of the main benefits you can provide with interactivity is you can provide the initial, you know, it's a, it's a common structure to provide, like, like the initial kind of zoomed out big picture view, mm -hmm. but then let people drill down to get more detail, let mm -hmm. people filter the data to get more detail, let people resort the data right uh, or maybe overlay other data mm -hmm. on top of that is this so all time lapse time lapse is also that in yeah you know, absolutely so you could maybe play something through time so if you have values that change over time uh, values maybe you can let the user adjust time so they can play through kind of in a regular fashion or they can jump back around and go backward and forward and see how things change great you might do that on a, a map, for right, example, absolutely. where you can't have like so many bars moving up mm -hmm. and down, but you can right. have the map shift. And those can really add impact to what you're trying to say. Yeah. To tell your story, right? Absolutely. And, it, and that's the kind of thing that can be done in print, but giving the user that, that control that they feel over mm -hmm. the visualization while hopefully still being honest about all the representations you're using. Absolutely. Um, that can provide a lot of insight. Okay, great. Well, you've given us some great tips to get started on working with our data and uh, turning them into interactive visualizations. So I want to thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you so much.